Well, I don't know, I feel like I'm sitting in the middle of a Christmas card, right? I love the backdrop, and I have a really, really important question to ask you today. Now listen, listen up. If you're online, I need you to listen. You can answer it yes or no in the chat room. If you're here, you can stand if you're really proud of this or just raise your hand, but it's a really, really important question. And my question is this. How many of you in the last year or so have watched at least one Hallmark movie? How many of you? Oh, you guys, I'm proud of you. This service is much more well attended and supportive of Walmart, or Walmart, Hallmark. Walmart too, right? <laughs> Hallmark too. Anyway, um, even my husband, Chuck, and some of you know my husband, Chuck. You know, I had to, I, he was so entrenched in Hallmark movies, I had to go buy him a shirt, and I couldn't get him out. I had to argue with him, football Hallmark, football Hallmark, and he chose Hallmark. Gosh. Anyway, it's the gift that keeps on giving, truly. And some of you I know, some of you have the Hallmark Now app or the Hallmark app, and you are living the best life ever. Well, every year there's hundreds of thousands of people, men and women, who can't get enough of these seriously unremarkable movies. They're filled, however, right, with romance and snow and Christmas trees and a beautiful town street and a town hall. They're filled with single dads who are trying to find a, a, a wife and single moms whose daughter's trying to make the hookup with the single dad, right? And even Chuck got it all figured out one long weekend where I twisted his arm basically to say, I'm going to talk about Hallmark and you've got to put on, you've got to like watch at least one of these movies so I can talk about you. But he even figured it out that that infamous kiss never happens until the last two to five minutes of the show. Never, ever before he figured it all out. You know, Hallmark consistently outperforms all the other networks for the entire fourth quarter. Consistently. Why? Because Hallmark has figured out something in these movies that's perfectly formulated, perfectly predictable, and something that I think taps into the need that the story ends well. The story ends well. We don't sit on the edge of our seats wondering, does this stressed out executive who lives in New York City decide to leave his job and or stay in his job to go to Vermont to marry the baker when they met finding a Christmas tree only to fulfill her daughter's wish that her mom would find a guy. Who saw that one? Yeah, <laughs> Christmas in Vermont, right? We don't wonder. And let me tell you, I think that all of us, whether we're sitting here today or watching online, I think we need to be truthful because we want something predictable right now, don't we? We want something predictable. Those of you who have kids, you want to know that your kids are going to be back in school from 8 o'clock in the morning until 3 o'clock in the afternoon, Monday through Friday, until the end of May. You want to know that they're going to be the teacher's project for the next several months. You want to know that we're going to be able to have Christmas around a beautifully decorated dining room table with all the beautiful china and the dishes, or maybe the Melmac in my case. But you want to know that this is going to happen. And instead of in a lawn chair in your garage around a five-gallon bucket with the heater, with the propane heater, we want to know that we're going to be able to come as planned to the Christmas Eve services this Thursday and Friday or from wherever else you are going or watching. You want to be able to go there, light the candles, sing O Holy Night without the chance that you're going to have to change it all because somebody in your family got COVID. We want something predictable. But the reality is our lives are seldom like a Hallmark movie. Seldom do they look like this peaceful, serene street behind me. Well, this Christmas, I found myself drawn to the story of Joseph. You know him, Joseph, the father of Jesus, whose part in the Jesus story doesn't usually get a very big part. It doesn't get a lot of airtime. 
And Joseph has an unexpected visit, first by his fiancée, Mary, followed by an unexpected visit from an angel, followed by yet another unexpected turn when he's told, Joe, put your pregnant wife on a donkey, take her to Bethlehem because there's a census, and that's where you got to go. Joseph has to put aside his best laid plans and he's got to learn to deal with the unexpected. When just like us, just like me, we prefer the predictable. We prefer the big predictable. A predictable engagement, a predictable wedding, and a predictable life. Wouldn't that be nice? Well, this story is found in Matthew chapter 1. You can follow along with me. It's on the screen. You can follow in your Bibles or on your phones. And here's the story. This is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother, Mary, was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he'd considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She'll give birth to a son. You're to give him the name of Jesus because he'll save the people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they'll call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. And when Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him. He took Mary home as his wife, but he, he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name of Jesus. Now, I think it's always important that we look at a little bit of history, and I think it's important to look at Jewish history. There were three steps in Jewish history in Jewish, Jewish marriage. Some of you maybe have been following along in the Advent that Will's been writing, so you may already know this. But if not, first of all, the two families had to agree to the union. They had to agree to it, and most marriages were arranged in that day. There wasn't this elaborate engagement scheme where the groom would say to the mom and the dad, could I have your daughter's hand in marriage, and then has this elaborate, sneaky proposal. No, that wasn't the case back then. Usually it was arranged, and it was a matter of the young man asking, wasn't so much a matter of the young man asking if he could, but it was more about being told he should. He should. They should get married. So the second thing that happened is the announcement was made. And then once the announcement was made, the couple was engaged. Similar to engagements today, except that their relationship, could, their engagement could only be broken through death or divorce, even though sexual relations were not yet permitted. Death or divorce. Third part that happened is the couple was married. And you think weddings are overdone today. Jewish weddings were a big deal. They lasted about five to seven days. They normally were held in the fall after the harvest was put to rest and then all of the people in the city, in the towns, could come and be part of the activities, the festivities. It was a big, big deal. And while Joseph may have been a bit like many grooms today, I talked to a groom just about three weeks ago and he was so ready for the wedding to be over just wanted to, to be done. Maybe Joseph was like that too. But now he's met with the unexpected. He's got a little bit of a hiccup. Anyone have their best laid plans ripped apart lately? Anyone? I certainly have. And I know that you have too. Sometimes our plans unravel slowly over a period of weeks and months, and then sometimes just in the flash, in a, the snap of a finger, everything changes. True story. The day I was starting to write this, and it had been ruminating for a while, and I decided what I was going to land on, I received a text message from one of my dear co-workers. And she said, please pray for me. I've just received devastating news. 
Not even two minutes later, I got another text message from another dear friend saying, pray for my family. My brother just had a stroke. I felt like I had enough content already in my message. And about a week later, I got a call from my sister. Julie, pray for mom. She's on her way to the hospital in an ambulance. We think she had a heart attack. What do you do when the unexpected happens? What's your response? There are all kinds of responses, all kinds of them. Sometimes we move into a place of denial. Sometimes we get angry. Sometimes we blame, we grieve, we numb, we feel sorry for ourselves. We move into a place of, I'm just going to take care of this problem. We move into a place of controlling and trying to control the outcome. And none of those is necessarily bad because short-term responses are short-term responses. It's when we live in that a long, long period of time and we don't learn anything from it. Listen, friends, no matter how much we wish we could go around a situation, under it, over it, or be be delivered from it, we usually have to walk through it. We usually have to walk through it. And we need to learn to let go of what was and then get a firm grip on what is. And God wants to teach us. He wants to use us. He wants to teach us things in the things that are difficult, in the things that are unexpected. What if, just what if, what if we learn to embrace the unpredicted shocks, the unpredicted stressors, the volatility of life, and just let God use it in our lives. John 16, 33, it's a familiar verse to many of us, I imagine. It says this, in this life you will have trouble. I believe Pastor Mike shared this scripture last week. Say this with me, in this life you will have trouble. You will have trouble. It's a guarantee. Joseph was faced with trouble, with troubling news, And although he could have, he knew that taking Mary as his wife could be humiliating, he chose to obey the angel's commands to marry her. He chose to walk through the fire with her. Verse 19 of Matthew 1 says this, Joseph was faithful to the law. And some translations say he was righteous. The word righteous means this, it means morally right or justifiable virtuous. The text goes on to say, and yet he did not want to expose her to public disgrace. He had in mind to divorce her quietly. Now listen, according to Jewish civil law, he could have divorced her. They weren't married yet, okay? He had that right, and the Jewish authorities also could have stoned her to death. You can read about that law in the book of Deuteronomy. Because Mary and Joseph were engaged, Mary's apparent unfaithfulness carried a severe social stigma. But what does the word righteous mean again? It means morally right. It means virtuous. And Joseph chose to do the right thing. He chose to become selfless rather than self-absorbed. His love for Mary, his right relationship with God, allowed him to respond to the Holy Spirit's leading when told by the angel what was going to happen to make the right decision. Listen, church, just because we can do something doesn't mean we should. Just because we can doesn't mean we should. Just because at the the legal age of drinking you can drink doesn't mean that you should. Just because you can go to a party and get wasted doesn't mean you should. Just because you can buy a $400,000 house doesn't mean you should. Just because you can sign your kids up for travel soccer league that takes all kinds of money and time doesn't necessarily mean that you should. You get my point. God's best for us is found on the other side of every single decision, whether it's big or small. God wants the best for us. And when we're faced with difficult situations, when we're we're faced with a tough choice or decision, we can ask ourselves some questions. 
these are some things that have helped me. These are some things that I've said to, to people that I've mentored. Ask yourself, is this necessary? Is this helpful? Is this going to draw me closer to Jesus, or is it going to push me away? What's this going to do for my mental, for my physical, for my spiritual health? What's this decision going to do for our family? Is this going to be a healthy decision for my family, or is it going to be detrimental to my family? What's the right thing to do? Is it the right thing to do? Because just because we can doesn't mean we should. Well, the text goes on to say in verse 20, after he had considered this, considered what? Considered what? Let's face it. When we're met with the unexpected, our mind starts going all kinds of different places. And when I, what I see when I read this is that Joseph didn't make any quick decisions. I don't know if you, about you, but sometimes I've made impulsive decisions that were detrimental. Joseph didn't do that. He gave it thought and prayer to, to the things that he was facing. He didn't make an impulsive decision. And in the face of the unexpected, I think God often tests our willingness to allow him to set our plans, to upset our plans, and to set his plans in motion. And when we become personally heart-ready to submit to his plan, to his purposes, to his call, to his will, well, then God does an amazing inner work in us. He wants to reveal his unexpected working in our lives that will reveal new things to us that we'd never thought would be possible. One of my favorite contemplative writers is Henry Nouwen. Perhaps you've heard of him, perhaps not. He wrote a book called, he's written many books, but one of them is called Out of Solitude. And this is what he says, you can follow along with me. He says in it, one of the greatest conversions in our lives is to recognize and believe that many unexpected events are not just disturbing interruptions, but the way in which God molds our hearts and prepares us for his return. When our good plans are interrupted, our well-organized careers by illness or bad luck, our peace of mind by inner turmoil, our desire for a stable government by a constant changing of the guards, and our desire for immortality by real death, we're tempted to give in to a paralyzing boredom or to strike back in destructive bitterness. But when we believe that patience can make our expectations grow, then fate can be converted into a vocation, wounds into a call for deeper understanding, and sadness into a birthplace of joy. One of my favorite scriptures is, comes from the book of James, chapter 1. It says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you face trials of many kinds, because the testing of your faith produces perseverance, and perseverance, character, and character, hope. Now, I didn't say I liked that scripture, but it's one of my favorites because it's helped me time and time and time again when things were difficult and I needed to find the joy in the difficult. And I love the translation, the, the Passion Translation. It says it this way, My fellow believers, when it seems as though you're facing nothing but difficulty, see it as an invaluable opportunity to experience the greatest joy you can. For you know that when your faith is tested, it stirs up power within you to endure all things. And then as your endurance grows even stronger, it will release perfection into every part of your being until there's nothing missing and nothing lacking. Now listen, the text that we read about Joseph, the text doesn't tell us that Joseph accepted his fate with joy. It doesn't say anything really about that. But I want to take just a little personal liberty here because I'm going to assume that Joseph didn't go into this deep place of self-pity for the next several months. I'm going to assume that he aggrieved. He was a human being after all, right? He was human, and we need to grieve. When grieving is necessary, we need to do that. He probably looked around, he probably saw his buddies who were having a normal engagement, whose, whose uh, fiancé wasn't pregnant. 
But in reading the choices that Joseph made, I have to believe that he didn't live in denial and anger and bitterness constantly for the next several months. And even those early years, those years of Jesus of being a dad, I have to believe that he found a place of joy and maybe, maybe a place of peace. I have to believe he came to a place of peace. And I don't know about you, but it can take a while to get there. It can take a while to get to that place where you have that inner peace. But I believe and I know that that's where God wants us to land. He doesn't want us to live in this place of turmoil. So remember the call that I got? It's just right before Thanksgiving. It was unexpected. And what followed were the ongoing realities of my mom's failing health with Parkinson's. And the challenges and the tor turmoil, and I mean truly turmoil. One of my friends I work out with is here today, and she knows I was in that place. We felt we didn't feel like any of our decisions were going to be good. Isolation in hospitals, the questions about whether she should go back home, whether she could go back home, whether we should put her in skilled care, where yet nobody could see her again. Many of you have been facing those realities this year with loved ones with sickness and hospitalizations and, and parents living in isolation by themselves. You know these feelings. And we experience them all, anger, grief, denial, sadness and then because i am a middle child i'm going to take control i can fix this my two there's four of us all together and, and my brother gary and i both it's like yes we're going to fix this we're going to take care of this and then we just kept praying god give us wisdom because none of the decisions seem like the exact right decision well, it was early in the morning, actually 3.30 in the morning to be exact, and um, I couldn't sleep. My husband was gently purring because nothing keeps him awake at night. And he was sound asleep, and I decided to get up and do what everybody does at 3.30 in the morning, maybe if you're a hormonal woman. 3.30 in the morning, you get up and you set the table. I was like, I'm going to set the table for Christmas, even though I had no plans for any company at all over Christmas. And I kind of forgot about the cheap Target dishes I bought last year at the end of Christmas sale. But I'm like, I'm going to get those out and set the table. And I pulled the, the dishes out, sat them on the table, and the first one was this one. And it stopped me dead in my tracks. Yeah, God, you got my attention. You have my attention. And I stood there, and I felt as if God had taken a warm blanket and just tossed it over my shoulders. And I just stood there, and I started talking with them. And then I sat down on the couch, and I, I pulled out, out the book of John, and I started reading. And I started reading in John where Jesus is sitting with his disciples, and he's preparing them for this time when he's going to go away. And it's a troubling time in this time of history. And he says, I'm going to go away, but listen, guys, don't worry about it because I'm going to leave you the Holy Spirit. This Holy Spirit is come, going to come and he's going to be your counselor. He's going to be your encourager. He's going to be your comforter. And I'm just reading the story. And I tell you, I felt such peace because he ended this scripture, this portion of scripture saying this to them. In me, you will have peace. In me, you will have peace. In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, because I've come to overcome the world. And friends, listen, some of you need to find that peace in the midst of the unexpected, unpredictable, messy situations in your life right now. Some of you have allowed bitterness to creep deep in your soul. You tell people, it's okay, I'm good, 
I got it going on. I moved on. No worries. Don't worry about me. But everything else that you say and do does not exude peace. And you numb. We numb with medication and with drugs and with alcohol and with eating and with shopping and being on social media. We numb out, hoping it'll go away. And it doesn't. It doesn't go away. It's still there. Maybe, maybe, just maybe, peace comes from accepting and embracing what is. We see our Lord Jesus do that. Just days before he's taken away, tortured and crucified. We see him on the face before his father. And he's saying, if it's possible, Lord, would you take this from me? But nevertheless, not my will, but yours, God. But yours. In our acceptance, in our surrender, we find that peace. But that peace can only come, friends, from a deep, abiding relationship where we let Jesus, by the very presence of his Holy Spirit, fill us, walk with us, lead us hand in hand, being there with us every step of the way as a follower of Jesus Christ. And I pray that as we walk into this Christmas season, into this Christmas week ahead, you know that your lives are not Hallmark predictable. Somebody's going to come down with COVID. Somebody's going to get sick. There will be things that make us not happy. But neither was the birth of our Savior. That was not predictable. His parents didn't expect to have to go from end to end to end to try to find a place for him to be birds. They didn't expect that he was going to be born in a stable. And yet, the unexpected, unpredictable turned into great, great joy. And that gift changed the world for a lifetime. How does God want to change you this season, friends? If I could, I would sit face to face and have a conversation with every single one of you. Just ask you that. What does he want to teach you? I pray, first and foremost, that you would embrace and accept the gift of Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Because he came to give us abundant life and I pray that in him, you would find joy and peace in the unexpected, unpredictable circumstances of life. Let's pray.